So I'm going to turn the microphone over right now to Larry Rotenstock, who is co-founder and CEO of iTech I. Hi, everybody. It's great to have you all here. We do love having guests. I want to tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about the organization so you have an, an idea of what you are in for. Um, I uh, had a very checkered past where I made a documentary film. I made several for PBS. I made one about a prison, which made me, for some reason, want to go to law school to study law to do my first in particular. Juveniles, I worked as a carpenter. I was a single unmarried dad. Why I was in law schools, I didn't take classes. I worked as a, as a, as a carpenter. And then, uh, rather than going to law, I got a job uh, teaching at Harvard's uh, psychiatric hospital for, uh, for patients there. And I taught carpentry. That's what I did. I did that for a couple of years. And then I taught in the Boston Public Schools. And I of the segregation. I taught carpentry. And that was like Mississippi was. It was where we saw people throwing bricks at babies and buses. And then I went over to the Cambridge Public Schools where I taught carpentry for many more years. Um, so um, you'll see that some of us here really still fly carpentry. Okay. <laughs> and then um, while I was doing that, I got this opportunity to uh, work on the Perkins Act. If you know the Perkins Act, you should all know the Perkins Act because it basically funds all of you. And, and it first came from 1917 when it was called the Smith Hughes Act. It was the second piece of federal legislation. The first piece of was, it was the Morrill Act, not Morrill as in having good morals. The Morrill Act was, it was in 1880, and that was to create schools of agriculture that would teach how, teachers how to teach, teach agriculture because they were trying to develop that part of the country's capacity. So in 1917, what happened? Why did they do Perkins? It's just like today, in fact, where we have kids here who are here legally and who are Latino and are, and are frequently talking to their teachers in elementary and middle school about the fact that they're gonna to have to leave the country if Trump wins, which is criminal that they feel that way, and it's happening really a lot. What happens episodically happened in 1917, World War I, and then many other times, and right now, is when the country gets scared, it gets anti-immigrant. And everybody in this country, my mother was an Italian war bride, my grandmother, my father's side came from Eastern Europe, everyone came from someplace else. Okay, I do digress. So Perkins, uh, Perkins was created and I had, they wanted someone to work on the reauthorization at the Harvard Center for Law and Education. And so I worked there with Paul Wexstein and we put in this language, you probably don't know it, it's still in there, I apologize for it, it's called the all aspects of the industry law and it says, it says, students, we wanted to get away from narrow skill training for specific occupations because only 21% of kids who major in a certain technical area at high school ever enter a related field for even a single day, which does not mean it was of no use for kids to do carpentry, but it just meant that it did not have predictive validity about what they were gonna be doing later. So the sentence that we put in was, Students should gain strong experience in and understanding of all aspects of an industry, including finance, planning, management, underlying principles of technology, labor issues, community issues, health and safety issues, and environmental issues as they pertain to that industry. Why was that? Because the average American, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, has eight to 12 jobs in a lifetime. They work in several places, and those would be skills that would carry them to the many different places that they would work rather than the narrow skill training of carpentry, which I still love to this day, okay? So while I was there um, and had left the high school, which is right across Harvard Yard, I met somebody who had worked in the same building with me for seven years. He worked on a different floor than I did. You're about to be meeting Rob Reardon very soon um, and who I've had uh, one of the best gifts in my life is that I've had decades of working with this person from whom I continue to learn much. Um, and we have traveled the country looking at schools. And one of the times that we did that was a big grant that we got from the federal government called the New American High School or the New Urban High School. It had actually multiple names, but we went around the country looking at schools. And the idea was to, well, we, it was sort of, well, I have a way that I describe what happened. There was a movie at that time that was made on a shoestring by a, a, a new filmmaker in San Francisco called Chan is Missing. It was about 
his Uncle Chan. It's a Friday night. He lives Uncle Chan. Uncle Chan doesn't speak English in San Francisco, like many people who've lived there for decades, which is fine. And, he's, and Uncle Chan doesn't come home, and he's looking for him. And on Saturday, you go with the son to five or six places. People say, oh, he might be there. He might be, oh, someone else says, no, he does that. Someone else says, oh, no, no, this is what his interest in. And the beauty of the film is that it ended without resolution of finding out whether he found Chan or not. But you saw this multifaceted view of an elderly Chinese American gentleman in San Francisco. And, we, and to, I use the language that the New American High School is missing because we never really found it. We just found pieces of it. And you are coming to a place that has some of those pieces, and none of us have all of those pieces. Um, so we leak oil every day, make no mistake about it. So I'll talk about how we got here, specifically. So in the course of doing that, oh, <laughs> we're really here because of somebody else who's here. And uh, we went to one classroom, and he's sitting in the back right now. We went to one classroom on that whole trip, and we wanted to look at internships because the next law that I also worked on some at Harvard was, was the School to Work Opportunities Act, which was, uh, um, was 1992, which is the whole idea of having internships because internships have really interesting predictive value, mostly in that it increases students' um, college entering and completion rates. That, that's what's so curious, because they're working with adults in an environment. And so um, we went to a certain school in a very low income area in this community, where Ted Williams went to school, whose mother was Mexican, I did not know. And anyway, and this was an internship uh, in a hospital, and there were 12 or 14 students sitting in an oval, and this teacher, towards the end of the year, was sitting at the back fussing with his papers as if he had nothing to do with what we were seeing, as his, his classic way. And, um, and this young lady who was uh, of color was pregnant with a boy, and she had done a study on whether or not he should be circumcised from a, a biological point of view, from a, a social point of view, from a religious point of view, from an ethical point of view. And here were these inner city teenagers talking about, frankly, penises, and you know, and with and seriously, in, in this, it was like we were in a, it was like we were in a medical school. It was it was absolutely stunning. And Rob and I left the class a little bit early. And as I recall, we stepped out on the landing, and just uh, the Zen moment, we just looked at each other in silence and knew we'd found something. And that led to somehow or other, I won't get into that, our being in San Diego. And there's somebody in San Diego who has most of the patents on this thing. He's 82 years old. When he was in high school in Massachusetts and he got into Cornell, his dad had a clam shack and his guidance counselor told him that he should go into the hospitality program at Cornell. And he said, no, I want to go into engineering. And he said, <laughs> his guidance counselor said, why do you want to go into engineering? Everything's already been invented. So, so <laughs> he said that to the guy who invented cell phones, okay? Nice guy. <laughs> As one kid said to me one day, if you're so smart, how come you're a high school guidance counselor? I said, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> so, so, we, so he, because of what I've said about what's going on right now, it was the same kind of situation, 98, 99, the economy's collapsing, we've got to cut off H-1B visas and stop immigrants from coming in. That train is never late. He's got 23,000 employees who are engineers, He's got 12,000 employees who do other things at this big company in town, and their language was there, there was no ROI, there was no return on investment trying to get the district to do the types of things that we're here to talk about. And they said, why don't we just stick a flag in the ground and start a school from scratch that could do this type of thing with a bit of an engineering and making things uh, uh, kind of feel to it. And that's where we stepped in. And we were just going to do one school. You'll be around seeing the schools right here. But it's the original is High Tech High. It's, it's down this way. It's right. This was a Navy base, 500 acres. We were in chance favors the, pre the prepared mind, as somebody once said. We were very, very lucky. And we've been lucky more than anybody deserves to be lucky. And so we got the first building. And there were eight of us who started. And I think Ben was there's like four of us still here, maybe, of the original eight. And uh, we don't have that much churning, but still some churning. And then we did a middle school next to it. There was, no, there was no photosynthesis out here at all. One benefit of the years I worked as a lawyer at Harvard was that I was in a windowless crypt. 
And I realized that photosynthesis is also for human beings. That's why you're going to see glass, glass, glass. And so we did that. Then we did another school. And then we did another school. And now we've got seven schools here. And we also, on the border, right on the border, because the mountains behind us are Mexico and Chula Vista, we have an elementary and a middle and a high. And North County, we have another elementary, middle, and a high. And right in the middle of that triangle is another property that the district just sold us. And I, I keep saying that those are going to be our last schools, but we'll see. Um, so this building is the building that SEAL Team 6 used to train in. So it is, um, it is basically a, a neoclassical building. A neoclassical building would be if you had the architecture of the building and you drew it, it would be like a Rorschach, and you split it open, just like a lot of buildings in DC. So you'll see that. So there's a big, there was a big gymnasium at that end, which is a gymnasium. This was a gymnasium. You can see that. And then in between was a swimming pool um, that was empty. It had not been used in decades. It, was, it had a lot of signage on it, because SEAL Team 6 trained there. I did not know SEAL Team 6 was around for decades. There were little portholes down low where commanders could yell at them, you know, I guess, or whatever. Um, it was, there is no Stephen King book or movie that scared me more than that room. And, and I've been there with a little burly, a bunch of burly contractors who felt the same way. And we still have a sign that we got out of there, and we don't know what to do with it, because it's kind of nowhere really appropriate, that in 1950s font says, guys, don't go in the pool with VD or TB, okay? Um, and so I've since checked with several doctors who have assured me that you can't get VD or TB from a swimming pool, but I'm not going to push the issue with SEAL Team 6, okay? So, so and then for some reason, um, we decided to start a graduate school of education. Well, that was really, whose idea, <laughs> whose idea was that? Okay, um, and, and I'm really glad we did. But it took, it was a long eight-year uh, struggle to convince people um, that having a graduate school of education that was embedded in K-12 schools was, was not only a good idea, but that it was, that it was actually okay. And Ted Sizer, who was a lovely gentleman, um, who was a, a, a significant mentor to Rob and me, uh, who was, actually he was dean at Harvard when he was 31. He passed when he was, I think, 78. But he once said, Having a graduate school of education that's not embedded in K-12 schools is like uh, have going to uh, uh, being in a hospital that, you know, that, that doesn't have any patients, right? So in a sense, not that our students here are patients. So I, because I want to tell you how we select students here. First of all, oh, we are a charter school. Okay, in Mass I was just in Massachusetts this weekend. There's a big thing about whether to cut off charter schools or not and stuff like that. I'm not a charter school guy. I'm an education guy. I personally think that innovation in the governance model is an interesting, but in and of itself insufficient condition for creating a good school, as we've seen from many types of charter schools. But for us, it gave us the flexibility to do what we wanted to do. They're public schools. They're California public schools. We get the same amount of money that public schools do in California and no more to operate. We have to do, deal with the state department just like everybody else does, okay? So that's really interesting to know about us, right? Um, and as far as the grad school is concerned, we have, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not the person to explain all the different programs we have, but we do have uh, credentialing, first of all, which is one thing, which is interesting that California has one organization that authorizes credentialing and another one that authorizes Grad schools, that does, I, they're working to put those together. But that's not something that happens in most states. Um, so how to choose students here was the most significant issue for us all. And because of the DSEG suits that I witnessed, um, we knew that we wanted to be reflective of the demography of the metropolitan area of San Diego. We knew that there was something that I had not known before called Proposition 209, which does not, which I don't agree with for its worth, which does not allow the use of race or ethnicity for selecting anybody for a public institution. I've had, so it had a very deleterious effect on access uh, by people of color to the state universities, that's for sure. At any rate, so, and then we had this idea. Okay, you, uh, zip codes. 
Zip codes predict socioeconomic status and ethnicity extraordinarily well. So we're not using race, we're using a five-digit number, and it's going to get us the same result because of housing segregation. So that, so we have a very sophisticated way that we do it. It's very, very regulated. We have about six, 7,000 applicants every, day, every year. And, and what we do is the, the computer picks whatever percent of kids reside in every zip code area. And that's, so all the kids that you're seeing here, that's how they got here. A sibling will get in over a non-sibling in a, an underrepresented zip code. A sibling would not get in over a non-sibling from a fully represented zip code. I could go on and on about how fine-grained it is, okay? So, and then we decided, which some people could quibble with in today's world, that we were going to focus on four-year college completion rates. People will tell you about ours, ours are very high, very high for the population we have. And also, their STEM focus because of our original funder rates, which are pretty much operating about double the national average, okay? And I think that it's because kids are making and doing and building and shaping things just like you do with a lot of them that they're saying, this could be me. And, 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 and Rob has often said, and you know, that's really what we want them to feel like, that this, this is you, this is, this is you, this is who you can be. Um, we have a motto, how, much, how many minutes, am I done? Two more? We have a motto, uh, work hard and have fun. Um, so I want you to have fun while you're here. I think that all learning should be thoroughly enjoyable. Um, sometimes it's not fun, but it is a lot of the time. I'm really, I don't know, if is it time for a question or two, or should I not do that? I'll pass on it if you, if you but, but look, it's great to have you here. I, I really, I really, really mean that. We love doing this because we're trying to educate the kids here to the best of our ability and help everybody and ourselves change the world. Thanks, everybody. Welcome.